Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian. Today I want to talk to you all about fibers and fabrics. I just wanted to introduce you all to some basic textiles knowledge. That way you can be better informed shoppers when you're out there thrift shopping or vintage shopping or even shopping online when it tells you what something is made out of or if you're buying fabric to make your own reproduction clothing or so any project really. I just want you guys to be better informed when you go out there and are selecting fabrics or clothing out there in the world just so you know a little bit more about what a natural fiber is versus a synthetic fiber um, and what those terms mean all that kind of thing. Um, a lot of times here on this channel and in my hauls I will mention that I try and not buy polyester and try and buy natural fibers and usually I'm including rayon in that um, and a lot of people or a few people have noted like rayon's not actually a natural fiber and you must be textile savvy people out there but I think a lot of people probably just gloss over when I say that but today we'll get into it. Is rayon a natural fiber? Is it a thermoplastic fiber? We'll, we'll, we'll delve into all the details today so you can know what you are buying and what you want to buy when you're out shopping in the world. Also, as a quick disclaimer here at the start, I do have an apparel design degree. I did have to take classes, including lab courses with, you know, safety goggles, the whole thing um, when it comes to textiles. So I had textile lecture courses and textile labs. So I have learned all about this stuff before. That's part of the reason I have this knowledge still just lingering around. I, I literally paid for it. I have a big certificate, you know, that says that I have a degree that I don't normally use, but we're gonna use it today uh, just so I feel a little bit better about having to pay for it every month. Um, so that'll be good. But I, a lot of these things uh, I learned back several years ago now in university. So uh, I may be a little bit rusty. I may not use the exact terms for something like fiber versus, I don't know, like thread or thread versus yarn. Sometimes, uh, especially with like thread and yarn, I know when it comes to fabrics, um, there's like specific terms for these things, like when, what warp threads are versus warp yarns and things like that. But like all those kind of super detailed things, that's just not really the kind of pedantry we're getting into today. I just wanna go over a basic overview so that people can have a better understanding of fabric and textiles uh, in a very general way for people who haven't had to take textile courses. Um, so I'll try and distill some basics down for you from having done that work in the past. I actually taught the textiles like module of the Banana Republic associate training manual when I worked at Banner Republic several years ago and it always was like a marvel to me that people just didn't know very much about fabric or textiles at all even though something it's something we interact with every day everyone always is wearing clothes but you don't always know like what your flannel denim whatever that you interact with every day is made out of or how it was made things like that so um, a lot of people don't have a very general knowledge about fabric even so uh, just keeping things very basic I think is what I want to what I want to accomplish in this video. The two main takeaways I want you guys to have from this video are a better understanding of the difference between natural and synthetic fibers and the difference between woven and knit fabrics. So those are the two really big things I want to impart to you all today in this video but I will get into a little bit more detail about things as we go through here. So but we're going to start with talking about fibers just because in order to understand fabric it helps to know what exactly is it made out of. So what do I mean by fiber anyway? Um, let's let's take a look at this piece of yarn here. I just have a piece of wool yarn in front of me here. Now, if you imagine fabric as like the finished project or product <laughs> project fabric as a finished product, and then what is it made out of? If you like check a frayed edge of fabric, it's made out of little threads, right? And then those threads are made out of fibers, and fibers are like the smallest unit of fabric, basically. So this is a four ply um, wool yarn, which means it's four threads twisted together to create the like string itself. So there's four little strings in here. If you've ever separated embroidery floss or any worked with yarn at all, you know that it's made out of like multiple strands. And so the little tiny strands that make up the thread here are actually fibers. I will actually insert a close up of what these loose wool fibers look like. And these fibers are in this case, wool. So they're from a they're like sheep's fur, basically. And if you imagine what, um, if you've ever seen like a Pantene commercial where they show a close up of human hair, where it has those little scales and usually the Pantene is making them lie down smooth again. Um, all wool fibers, or all hair fibers have those little scales on them. And so if you were to take a microscope to this, this is what it would look like. And so they stick together quite well because those little scales sort of latch on one another, which is why it's easy to spin wool into a thread, into a yarn. Um, but these little fibers, basically, it's just like taking fabric down to its smallest component. So the smallest component of any finished fabric is going to be the fiber that the threads are made out of. But most natural fibers are staple fibers like this. They're just shorter fibers. That's why you actually get pilling on clothing. It's because some of the fibers are being escaping from the yarns and then they just get like when there's friction applied, they ball up on the surface. So that's why you get pilling on things is usually because of staple fibers sort of escaping 
um, the fabric, the structure of the fabric, the structure of the threads. And a lot of time you'll get pilling on something that's like a blend. So the filament fibers, if you have like a poly cotton blend and you have filament fibers for the polyester and then staple cotton fibers, a lot of times the staple cotton fibers will escape from that polyester thread and the poly will stay fine, but then this cotton gets balled up on the surface. So that's why you get pilling on some things. I actually did have to do pilling tests in my textiles lab where you would put like a little square of fabric into a machine that would just rub it until it pilled and then you could see like the percentage of pilling on a fabric depending on like the percentage of a blend. Let me tell you, those were riveting classes, just riveting. But those are just two terms that I will use when I'm talking about fibers here. Um, staple and then filament fibers basically just means short fibers and then long fibers. Of course, when it comes to thermoplastic fibers or synthetic fibers, you can't, they're just being made by a machine. And so instead of like, there's no reason to like chop the fibers short, you can make them as long as you want when you're extruding them, which is how, um, you know, polyester fabrics are, or fibers are made. They're extruded through sort of like, if you imagine a shower head, only much smaller. Um, and then you're just like extruding that plastic through very, very tiny holes. And then you're ending up with little manufactured fibers. But of course you don't have to cut those short. You can keep them quite long. Although sometimes when a thermoplastic fiber is being created to emulate something like a wool or a cotton, they will cut those into staple fibers so that they behave a little bit more like a staple natural fiber would. But again, that's getting a bit into the weeds here. So that's what fibers are and like the difference between staple and filament fibers. So let's go over what are considered natural fibers. So the main natural fibers are going to be cotton, of course, from the cotton plant. We've all usually seen like cotton balls. It looks like kind of how cotton grows. I'll put images of cotton here on the screen. Under a microscope, cotton fibers actually have a kind of um, almost DNA strand looking like double helix twisted appearance to them. And that again helps the fibers um, like lock together and create kind of strong thread, which is nice. Um, so they look interesting underneath a microscope as well. I'll try and include microscope slides for each of these fibers too, just because I think it's interesting. That might be nerdy of me, but you know, I think we've learned here on this channel enough that I am a little bit of a nerd, so it shouldn't be a surprise. Another natural fiber derived from plants is going to be linen or flax, which is another uh, plant product. It's kind of from the stalk uh, fiber beaten down, or at least in the past, it was beaten down out of stalks or like branches of a plant, or the flax plant in this case. So linen is another plant-based natural fiber. Another natural fiber is going to be silk, of course, and um, those are gonna be individual filament fibers from each silkworm cocoon. So each silkworm will create a cocoon to turn into a moth. And sadly, uh, in silk production, we don't let that happen because if they crawl outside of the cocoon, they usually destroy them and destroy the filament nature of the silk fiber. I'm sure there are probably like super vegan friendly silk manufacturers out there who do let the cocoons get destroyed and then just use them as staple fibers. I'm not sure, I'll have to look into that. If I do find anything on that, I'll include the link in the description. But more, most of the time, the <laughs> cocoons are like boiled or something to kill the silkworm inside because they want the cocoon. Um, and those fibers are extruded just like a, like spider makes their web. So little tiny, tiny strands, if you imagine a spider web, um, little tiny filaments fibers are created when a silkworm makes its cocoon. And then each cocoon um, will take set, they'll take several cocoons and then make a thread out of it. I'll try and put a video below of how this is done because it is quite fascinating and interesting and such a fusion of like nature meets industrial machinery that is kind of a marvel. So I'll try and put links in the description to how different fibers are turned into threads because that's all very interesting. If you want to get nerdy about this kind of stuff, I find it quite fascinating. So I'll put that in the description below as well. And then of course there are wool fibers, which are from sheep usually. Um, of course, there are different types of wool fibers like Angora or cashmere, different types of sheep out there. Um, there are also like really specific small, a lot of people who do fiber arts, if you do um, any kind of crafting like knitting or crochet and you've been to like fancy fiber shops, sometimes they'll have all kinds of different wools from different animals. And the softest one I've ever felt is from an animal called the Paco Vacunta. I will put an image of this very cute little llama-ish creature here. Um, they're like adorable, but the fibers from those, uh, from their fur is like the softest thing I think I've ever felt. I haven't delved into the animal rights research of this, you know, of wool in general. Some people don't wear wool at all, and I understand that, um, but I just wanted to cover it, of course, as part of our basic textiles knowledge, because it is one of the major natural fibers. So those are the major natural fibers, and then you also do have synthetic fibers. Synthetic fibers, um, the most common ones we think of uh, when it comes to synthetic fibers are thermoplastic fibers like polyester, nylon, acrylic, spandex. Those are the major like brand names of thermoplastic fibers that most people have heard of before. Um, and of course, you know, polyester comes with its own set of issues, which I will read a quote for you now from Wikipedia, which 
when I was doing research for this video made me a little bit sad, and that is that polyester is a synthetic petroleum-based fiber and is therefore a non-renewable carbon-intensive resource. Nearly 70 million barrels of oil are used each year to make polyester around the world, which is now the most commonly used fiber in making clothes, but it takes more than 200 years to decompose. So, not ideal. Polyester is just plastic on a very small scale, and as we know, plastics aren't the best thing for the environment. Of course, cotton and linen, those other guys, they do not, they are not without sin. Uh, they, co they cost a lot of energy, resources, water to create a cotton t-shirt and a polyester t-shirt. They both have their problems. So this is not to say that polyester is like a thousand billion times worse than cotton. Um, I don't really know enough of the science behind it to make a statement like that. I'm just letting you know that polyester is not, it is plastic and like other plastics, it is not the best for the environment. It's not super recyclable or we're not doing a very good job of recycling it uh, at this current time at least. One of the first thermoplastic fibers to be introduced was actually nylon, which was introduced in the 1930s, first as bristles for toothbrushes, and then the next year, actually in 1939, it was released as a material for women's stockings, like nylon stockings were the first introduced on the market in 1939, I suppose. And then, of course, nylon went on to be used more through the, like, mm, probably, like, not much in the 40s. I'm sure they probably took it over for war work, and that's why nylon um, wasn't, like, used to make a lot of clothes in the 1940s. But in the 1950s, you get, like, sheer blouses and, like, um, sheer materials often made out of nylon. And then also in the 1950s, there was another fiber called acetate. And then you start getting into polyester and, like, um, spandex and things like that in the 1970s and 80s. Um, all that kind of stuff kind of took over. As soon as thermoplastic fibers were available, because they were usually cheaper, I guess, probably, they really came into a lot of prominence. And now, of course, polyester is the most commonly used fiber in the world, which, uh, for better or for worse, really. And then another synthetic fiber, my one of my favorites, is going to be rayon. Now, the thing about rayon is, while it is a synthetic fiber, it is not a thermoplastic fiber. So unlike those other ones we were just talking about, which are made from, like, plastic polymer crazy chemistry, rayon, also ke crazy chemistry, but is made of a natural source. So rayon, the the goop that rayon is made out of is actually cellulose or wood pulp. It's a naturally derived material as opposed to polyester, which is made from like just a plastic. So rayon is a synthetic fiber in the sense that we make that goop. We extrude it out of a similar machine to the fibers that make, to the machines that make the fibers for polyester and things like that. But it is a naturally derived material and rayon as a fabric um, the fiber, once it is a fabric, behaves more like a cotton or a linen than a polyester. And that is why in my brain, I classify rayon as a natural fiber. Because for me, what's most important about a fiber, knowing about a fiber, is how it feels to wear it, or how it feels to sew it. And those are the things that matter most to me. I'm not a chemist. I don't really care, you know, what the heck it looks like before it's been made into a fabric. So for me, because rayon fabrics behave more like cotton or linen fabrics, in my brain, I classify rayon as a natural fabric for me, um, even though it is a synthetic fiber, which has led to some confusion here on this channel. A couple people have pointed out to me that rayon is not a natural fiber, even though I'm always talking about it as if it is. I do know, but I consider wood pulp to be a natural material, so sue me. There are some other names for rayons or different types of rayons as well, like lyocell or viscose modal. Um, there are even some fabrics like bamboo fabrics or fibers and things like that that are made um, in the same way where they take the wood pulp down to its bits, make a goo, and then extrude those fibers again. So um, there are different types of rayon or sort of hybrid fabrics like rayon or hybrid fibers, I mean to say, that are in between a synthetic and a natural like that. So rayon's not the only one. It's just the one that I come in contact with most often. And that's just how I feel about rayon. To me, it's a natural feeling fabric and therefore it goes in the na natural bin in my brain. The okay, the check mark of yes bin as opposed to polyesters, things that feel plasticky, things that are not as breathable, nylon, acrylic, poly, those all go in like a different, you know, bin in my brain. I just put rayon over here because it behaves like a natural fiber um, as opposed to behaving like the other synthetics that I am more familiar with. So now that we know a little bit more about fibers, how do fibers become fabrics. Well, if you've ever interacted with any fabric that has like a hole in it or has an edge to it, you will notice that where you pull it apart, it comes into little threads. So all fabric is made out of little threads that are made out of fibers as previously discussed. So these threads are either like spun, um, usually are spun. So you'll notice that they're like twisted, um, just like this yarn I was showing you earlier was it's all twisted to hold the fibers together into a thread. Um, and then those threads can be like this yarn, different plies. This is a rather, you know, thick weight. But if you just imagine like a fine fabric is made out of just very fine threads. Um, so that's kind of how fibers become threads 
which be are put on a loom and then woven or knit into a fabric. So we're going to get into those distinctions now. Now, in general, like the biggest generalization I can give you on like wovens versus knits are wovens don't stretch and knits do. Now, of course, this <laughs> you run into problems here because a lot of woven fabrics are blends now where they are blended with spandex and they do stretch quite a bit. So that can get you into trouble. But in, in very general terms, a woven is a like, if you imagine a non-stretched denim, like that's a woven fabric. And then you have knits, which is like a t-shirt fabric, which is a very stretchy jersey. Um, so in very, very, very basic terms, wovens don't stretch, knits do. Woven fabric at its like very most basic is woven at like a one-to-one -one ratio. So like for every thread you have going one direction, you have another going the other and they like interweave. Like if you imagine the top of like a traditional looking cherry pie and how the like basket weave goes, that's what a woven fabric looks like under a microscope as well. There are many, many different patterns you can have of different like woven fabric patterns. This is also how um, like brocade and jacquards are done. And if you don't haven't ever looked into like jacquard or brocade looms, I will link another video in the description all about that because that is basically the beginnings of computing, but don't let me get off track there. Um, so there are all kinds of different looms and different types of weaves to create different patterns. Something like a denim is actually a twill weave, which I'll put an image here of what a twill weave looks like very close up. But basically it's just like because of an alternating skip over uh, over under of the threads, it creates this diagonal whale or like um, rib ribbing to the fabric as um, you might have noticed on denim. If you look up close, there's like little diagonal lines in it. That's because it is a twill weave also used for things like um, khaki pants are usually twill. I use a lot of cotton twill in my sewing as well. It's got that good like hardy adventure kind of safari look to it. So I use a lot of twill in my own sewing. So let's look at a very basic woven fabric. This is just going to be a little square of cotton muslin. In woven fabrics, we have a couple of extra terms um, you might want to know if you want to give it fancy. If you can imagine with me a roll of fabric coming off a loom, the threads going in this direction are going to be called the warp, and then the perpendicular threads are called the weft. So on our small square here, how do we know which is which when they seem very similar? Well, it helps to look at the fabric right off the bolt or roll. So here's a larger piece of the same fabric where we can see the edge um, where it was like the edge of the bolt has what's called salvage. The salvage is the very edge of the fabric as it comes off the loom. Um, so the two like right and left sides of it and is often woven a bit tighter and the threads closer together um, than the main body of the fabric. So the direction or grain of the fabric can be more noticeable in some other weaves. Um, this one it's kind of hard to tell just because muslin is very super basic. Um, and some fabrics like velvet have a nap to them where the fabric looks different from different angles um, and sort of the fur of a velvet like lies down better in one direction or not. So when cutting out a sewing project it's important to keep in mind the grain um, or the nap of a fabric so that the resulting garment hangs correctly and doesn't look mismatched even though it's all from the same fabric. So if you cut uh, the front and back of a skirt, for example, you want to make sure that the waist and hem are like aligned the same way on a piece of fabric. So if you have a piece of fabric and like you have your skirt pattern, you don't want to do one like this and one like this really because they might hang differently. Um, although those are both cut on the straight grain, it's still kind of best if you can do them both the same direction. So whenever possible, do try and do that. Sometimes it doesn't super matter, but um, on fabrics like a velvet, for example, it really does matter that you have like the waist on one side, the hems on the other side, basically. So you have those pattern pieces going the same direction on the fabric, just because the when the light hits a fabric, it can look different if you have one skirt piece going this way and one going this way. Um, at the side seam, you might notice that it looks like almost two different fabrics, and that's just because the light is hitting the weave of the fabric differently. And so you just want to keep mind that um, keep these kind of things in mind. A lot of times on pattern instructions, it will tell you how to line up your pieces with the grain of the fabric. There'll be like cutting layouts and things like that. So if you're newer to sewing, they usually will have instruction on that kind of thing. And then you just kind of get used to it the more you do sewing projects, basically. There is one more term that I think you need to know while we're looking at our square of fabric here. And that term is bias. You may have heard the term cut on the bias before as dresses are often referred to as being cut on the bias. Bias is the diagonal of the warp and the weft here, so like the direct 45 degree angle between them. And woven fabrics often stretch most on the bias, which means if I have a skirt front here and I cut it on the bias instead of on the straight grain, it will hang differently over the curves of the body. When I think bias, I think of like 1930s slinky dresses because they're usually cut on the bi um, bias to hug the curves underneath basically. So bias just has a lot more flexibility in it. Sometimes certain things are cut on the bias or cut on the straight grain for a desired 
kind of fit or effect in the end garment. Something like really very flowy and then yet also very body conscious, usually cut on the bias grain of something. So when we say things like chiffon, jacquard, brocade, twill, satin, um, those are all different types of fabrics, but they can be made out of any fiber. So you can have a cotton twill, a silk twill, a wool twill. So a twill fabric has its own sort of properties. It's usually a little bit stiffer, for example, it hides soiling well, which is why it's used for denim. But you can make those different types of fabrics out of different fibers. Also things like chiffon, you've probably interacted with a silk chiffon and a polyester chiffon before. Um, polyester chiffon is a lot more durable than silk chiffon, which is super delicate and, I mean, gorgeous, but very floaty and like hard to sew with and harder to um, not get holes in it, things like that. So it's a more, much more delicate fabric. Whereas when it's made out of something like a polyester, the same fabric is has very different properties. Um, so those all are different types of fabrics, but not necessarily like when someone says, I would like to be something made, made out of silk, that is a fiber. It doesn't really mean like, I want something to be shiny. Like when you say silk, it can be silk twill, it can be silk velvet, it can be silk satin. So silk is a fiber, satin is a material, um, a type of fabric basically. And you'll hear me talk about cotton sateen a lot of the time, and that is with a satin weave. Um, so satin, twill, those are types of weave, the way the fabric is, the threads are arranged in the weave of the fabric as opposed to anything about the fiber. So I've used silk twills, wool twills, cotton twills before. So just know that those are our fabric terms and then fiber terms. And like you, you take one from each bucket as it were, you have a silk twill or a cotton, you know, sateen. We could do this all day, talk about the different types of fabric, um, but that I feel like is like a, a separate video. So if you want something like that, do let me know in the comments below. Um, but the only one, other one I wanna mention is crepes and crepe fabric is got a sort of like, it's not rough, but it's like rougher than like a sateen, for example, if you were like feeling it very up close. But crepe fabric has this sort of matte finish, pebbly almost texture up close. I will include a close up of what some crepe fabric looks like to show you guys. And I only just mentioned this because uh, it's a fabric that is often used in like 1940s dresses or mentioned in vintage clothes. A lot of 30s and 40s dresses were made out of like a rayon crepe or a silk crepe. And sometimes you will hear about like silks that are a satin faced crepe back. So it'll have like a satin finish on the front of the fabric and a crepe finish on the back. And you can use either side facing out as far as I'm concerned, but a lot of times people have the satin finish on the outside and the crepe on the inside. Um, so it's just something to be aware of like what a crepe finish is on a fabric. And usually a crepe finish is created by taking the threads um, and if you think think of a yarn like this and you have it twisted a certain amount, um, and if you over twist a thread, it starts like bunching up on itself. And that is how a lot of the times crepe fabrics are made. It's like allowing the yarns and threads to bunch up on themselves a little bit so that um, it creates that sort of pebbly texture. So that's just one other thing I wanted to mention uh, just because crepe fabric is so common in vintage sewing and clothing, just like what the heck that is. Um, but basically, again, you can have polyester crepe, rayon crepe, all different types, but that's just another fabric I wanted to mention here in this video, just because it is so common within the vintage market. For vintage fashion, I think it's most important to focus on woven fabrics. It's just what was used mostly for earlier periods of the 20th century. Once you get into like the mid 60s through the 1990s, knits became much more of a prevalent thing. And I do mean knit like fine fabrics in this case. Uh, obviously knit sweaters and like hand knits, um, things made of like bulkier yarns like this. Um, sweaters were very common in the 1940s and 50s, especially, you know, cardigan sets, things like that, that we are all familiar with. Those kind of knits are definitely popular in the earlier mid-century periods, but things like fine jersey or like just stretchy knit fabrics, like t-shirt fabric, if we think about like jersey fabric, that was just less common in the earlier half of the 20th century. So I don't ever really sew with knits and I don't, it's not like I actively like super avoid them. Like if there was a knit dress in a great very 40s print, that is actually quite accurate. They did a lot of knit jersey dresses in the 1940s. It's just not something I like to sew. Sewing with knits is like a whole different animal in my opinion. Um, they move around a little bit more. You need different needles. So I don't do a lot of sewing with knit fabric, but again, I of course do just want to mention it so you guys can know what the difference is and be informed when you are doing your own sewing and shopping in the future. Knit fabrics are different from wovens because instead of being like an interlocking basket sort of weave structure, it's one long continuous thread that is looped. Like if you have ever done any knitting or crochet, you know the structure of it is a little loop interlocking looping structure. So the, the yarns, the threads are done, are manipulated in a completely different way from wovens. And the loops are what give the fabric its stretch. I will actually show you a close up of like a plain knit um, 
from an old sweater I abandoned. So this piece of hand knit uh, fabric, if, if you will, will help me show you. Knits are made with like one long continuous thread. You pull on that baby and the whole thing can unravel. This is why a hole in a sweater and a hole in a blouse are two different animals. In wovens, you can darn or patch a hole. In knits, you've got to kind of like contain the situation and find the loose ends or else risk the whole thing unraveling like this. Knits stretch because of the looped nature of their construction. Because of those loops, there's a little bit of give and that helps give them that very stretchy quality. There are um, two-way knits, which only stretch in like one direction and then four-way stretch knits, which are stretch both like high <laughs> up and down and then side to side as well, or, like all directions, basically. Four-way stretch, uh, four stretch fabrics are things like very spandexy, um, almost like dance or swimwear material. Um, it's what we think about in that. A lot of jersey only stretches in one direction, or at least a lot of the jersey I've interacted with only is like meant to stretch in one direction as opposed to the other. Um, so you will come across two different types, like two different main types of knits there. Crochet also does stretch because of this sort of looped construction, but I don't think there's any fabrics that are made of crochet. Like if you take this very same knit structure and like shrink it all the way down, that's what Jersey fabric is. However, I don't know if there's any like shrunken down version of crochet. If there is, please do let me know because that is kind of fascinating how we have shrunk knits down to be a fabric, but we have not shrunk crochet down. There must be a reason that that is the case. And I would be interested in if anyone knows an article or something about that because Kind of interesting that we have knit fabrics but we don't have crochet fabrics but i digress but in general as a vintage reproduction seamstress i usually stick to woven fabrics i find them much easier to sew with i don't really have a lot of experience or knowledge sewing with knits it's not something i do often enough to feel confident in so i really do just stick to wovens and because they're quite historically accurate i find that that works for me in my re vintage reproduction projects so natural fibers and synthetic ones wovens and knits. Now we kind of know a little bit more about the distinctions between the two. Garments made of cotton, silk, rayon, linen fabrics are always just going to look a little bit more authentic than garments made in polyester. And sure, there are authentic 1950s nylon blouses. And of course, those look very vintage because they are literally from the 1950s. But as a general rule, items in natural fibers, fabrics made of natural fibers are going to look more authentic just because they didn't have polyester in the 1930s and 40s. So anything poly is just gonna look a little bit off no matter how authentic the style of it actually is because the fabric just doesn't have the same like subtle like drape and sheen and look of a natural fiber. I find it just never looks quite as authentic. And again, authenticity, authenticity isn't the end all be all in vintage style. Maybe you aren't even after a very authentic style and fair enough, totally. Um, but if you are looking for a more authentic look, try and stick to natural fibers. That's my biggest recommendation when it comes to natural versus synthetic when it and uh, concerning authenticity of a vintage look. The same goes for choosing fabrics for sewing reproduction clothing. You're going to want to choose natural uh, fabrics or like something like a synthetic like rayon over things like polyester. A silk chiffon is going to look so different from a polyester chiffon to, I mean, not to the, I guess, very, very like general public, but to anyone who knows a lot about vintage, it's just not going to look the same. It won't have the same authentic uh, like drape and feel as something that is actually the real the real deal. Like a 1920s dress made out of polyester is just never going to look as authentic as a real silk one would, um, which does rack up the price a little bit. Things like silk, wool, um, these fabrics cost more, I know, um, and they are an investment. And of course, I've made tons of like polyester chiffon 1920s dresses in my time. I have a few of them up in my closet still. Sometimes you just want a dress and like the print is cute. And even if it's poly, you just go for it. I understand. But like if you're after an authentic look experience recreation you're gonna gonna <laughs> you're gonna want to go with the natural fiber the fabrics that they used at the time so of course when we're doing our reproduction sewing uh, a lot about that is very vintage in the sense that like a lot of people in the 1930s and 40s in the 50s made their own dresses at home a lot of women made a lot of their own clothes back in the mid-century era so for us to like buy a vintage 50s pattern and make a dress at home. It's a very, like, to me, that is barely reproduction. If you're using a cotton print fabric and you're making your dress from a vintage pattern, that practically is vintage. Like the only thing that's missing is like 40 plus years of time sitting in someone's closet. Like that is as close to vintage as you can get making it yourself as long as you're using authentic materials or something similar to what they would have used at the time. I do find catalogs a very useful resource in this uh, regard. A lot of times in like Montgomery Ward's catalogs, I'll put a couple of images here on the screen that shows you this. In Under the clothes, they will tell you what fabric exactly it's made out of. 
And even if it's like a weird name, you can kind of look it up and see what the heck they're talking about. So it'll give you really good descriptions of the fabric something's made of. And then also they have fabric for sale in these catalogs. So they will tell you exactly about those fabrics in that section as well. So I find these really good resources for vintage seamstresses and people who just like vintage in general. So try and look through some old catalog pages like this. I will link to my Pinterest boards of some of mine. You can see them actually stacked behind me. I have a lot of Montgomery Ward's catalogs that I do try and scan and share with everyone just because I do believe they're such a valuable resource. So I hope that was a helpful introduction into the world of fibers and fabrics for some of you who may be newer to sewing or collecting vintage and wanted to know a little bit more about textiles in general. I just wanted to do kind of a basic overview so you guys know what I'm talking about because I feel like I do mention some of these terms in my hauls and other videos and I have never really explained what the heck I'm talking about. So I wanted to do that today. Um, if you guys have any additional questions about fibers or fabrics, things like that, do leave them in the comments below and either I will try and answer them or point you towards another resource that can better answer your question um, or other people can help help out and answer everybody's questions down there in the comments below. And thank you as always for tuning in today. I'll see you again soon. Bye.